Well, I want to say something that I believe the scripture points to and teaches very clearly, and it's this, that God created moms to reflect his heart for his children. God created moms. That's the reason. That's one of the main things God created women to be moms who reflected his heart. I can see it in the Genesis story, actually. Some of you remember a couple weeks ago, we talked about that vision that we get from Genesis 1.28, that God's original vision would be a father and a mother with their children going out into this untamed world and bringing order to it and subduing it and raising their children in a God-fearing way. And these families then would hive off more families until all the world was filled with families who loved the Lord and the Father would be at the center of it all. Unfortunately, the vision was broken even before children came along. But it didn't change what the original vision was always intended to be. And so that's where Adam steps into the story in a particular way for what we're talking about this morning. Now some of you remember, you remember... Adam, what he did before God gave him his wife? What did he do? Well, some of you were sleeping through the last one. In fact, sounds like all of you were sleeping through the last one. You remember the job? God gave Adam a job. It was to see what he would name all the creatures. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah, yeah, Pastor. We remember now. Yeah, he wanted to see, and that's, by the way, this is a little side note. I love that comment in the scripture because, you know what, we as parents, if you are are a a young adult or a child or you're in that situation where you wonder, how does my, my mom and dad feel about me? One of the things that parents love is they love to interact. They, they take great joy in their children. Well, that's how God feels about us, except with all, without all the mess that we get into with our parents. God looks at us and he wonders What are they going to do? Just like the father wondered what Adam would name all the animals. Remember, that job too, by the way, wasn't a one-day deal. It would have taken literally years to name all the animals. I was in the uh, vet's office the other day with my dog, and he's a mixed breed. That's a loving way to say it. He's a mixed breed. And uh, I was looking at the chart. I was in there trying to figure out, now, what is my dog? That's just the dogs. Can you imagine naming all the animals that walk on the earth and then all the animals that swim and all the animals that fly and all the, he named the insects too, all the creatures that slither and crawl on the ground. And then God gave him the woman. Now we're told very quickly that they both blew it because here's how we blow it. And by the way, this still happens today. Men get focused on careers and women get, try, get busy focused on trying to control things that can't be controlled. And next thing you know, they remove God from being at the center of everything. And that's the story of Genesis. But even after God comes and re- brings his correction to them, we still hadn't learned the woman's name. Until that moment when God looked at Eve, or Adam looked at Eve. And I want you to remember this now. It wasn't a coincidence that the father had Adam name all those animals to see what he would name them. Because now he was going to look at his wife and realize this vision's not lost yet. Just because we blew it in our past doesn't, doesn't wreck this vision of what the father wants for us in the future. And so he did the math in his brain. He thought to himself, if we're going to go forth in all of creation, and if we are going to bring forth peoples that populate the earth, then this woman that God gave me is going to be the one through whom God does that work. And so he named her Eve. There's plenty of people who don't even read the Bible who know that, but they don't know what Eve means. Eve means the source of the living. You see, a mother is meant to be that source, that life-giving source, that 
that person who experiences creative power that really only is meant for God. The ability to bring life from lifelessness. We're told in Psalm 139 that that's no small thing. In fact, before anybody even knew that we were created, it says that God knew us in our mother's wombs. Now I know for all of you that is a statement that hits in different ways. So listen to God's word as we go through this morning. Let it wash over you. Let let yourself be in the place of Adam and Eve after they blew it, wondering, is there any hope for us? And may you hear that hope through this story that we find in Exodus chapter 2. The story of the birth of Moses, beginning in verse 1. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman. And she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. And then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe. And her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. And when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. I want you to hear as we read the Lord's story this morning, a reflection of a statement that uh, a colleague of mine made. His name's Mark Mitchell. He's a pastor also here in Northern California. He said, a mother's ultimate purpose is to instill in her child a love for God. Now, most of you recognize, even as we put that quote on the screen, that there's plenty of folks that you know who wouldn't agree with that statement. Nevertheless, Just because someone doesn't agree with that statement doesn't mean it's not true. It is God's purpose and desire that women would raise children to fear the Lord. And in this story that we just read, that's what we have. A woman who reflects God's heart. And so what I want to walk through in that story we just read is four things about a mom who reflects God's heart. And the first one is this. A mom who reflects God's heart doesn't raise her children in order to be famous. How many moms in the room are going to shout amen to that? Right? Some of you are louder on that point than others for sure. But you all recognize this one singular truth. What a mom does quite often goes unnoticed. What a mom does is all the little things that nobody else ever seems to take credit for her or to credit her for or pay attention to. In fact, the number one complaint of mothers that I often hear is what? Maybe you've heard it too. Ingratitude. Because it's a recognition that, quite frankly, all I really want is just to thank you for what my heart wants to do anyway. You know, in this story that we read, you might recognize a key detail. Now, if you didn't already know this before I read the story and you know who you are, don't answer the question. Don't shout like, ooh, I discovered this. Okay, no. This is for those of you who didn't actually know the answer to this before I asked it in, in, in this moment. So like Eileen, like you did, you cheated at Easter, I just want you to know. And I took note of that. She was in the first service and then answered in the second service. That doesn't count. Now everybody's looking at you. (laughs) 
Happy Mother's Day. (laughs) So, are you ready? Here it is. What was strangely absent about this woman in the reading? Her name. Her name was never mentioned. In fact, it's not until the very next book of the Bible, which some people have a, or third, actually two books later, uh, they have a difficult time getting to because they never get through Leviticus, the third book of the Bible. But in the book of Numbers, we find out her name is Jochebed, the name of Amram's wife. Now, this is going to fit with what I'm going to say later, but I'm going to say it right here at this moment. The only reason we know her name is because she did her job and practiced her faith. Some of you are going to realize the person who wrote the book of Exodus was Moses himself. Now, Jochebed had been a a critical reader if she had been alive at the time, and we know she wasn't. She might have read that portion in what we call Exodus 2 and then said to her son, Hey, um, son, um... Yeah, you didn't say my name. All I want is a little thanks. But just because Moses didn't notice didn't mean God didn't. There's a line said about another mother in the scripture, and I want all of you women to hear this. All you women, not just mothers. God is the God who sees you. He knows you. And what you do matters to him. And so a mom who reflects God's heart will also be, number two, a person who is willing to do whatever it takes to protect and nurture her children. God sees these acts of sacrifice and mercy. I wonder if you noticed it during the story. Some people look at this story through a skeptical lens. They see a mother discarding her son into the river, but that's not what the story is. Actually, if you pay attention to the details, it's actually quite the opposite. Here's a mother, and we'll assume Amram was there in the decision-making process too. Amram and Jochebed grieving and hurting because they know this son that they love, they have to give up. They go through this drill where they set up a situation The creation of that basket and uh, a basket that could float and hold their son. And they know the spot where the royal family bathes at the river. They get their daughter coached up. And most of you would recognize the unnamed girl in that passage is Miriam. And Miriam would have had to been coached up and, and and. prepared for the moment that was coming for her, and they got the situation all ready to the point where Miriam and Jochebed go down to the river with the child, and they put that child in the basket, and at at about the time where they knew the royal family would be coming down to bathe and hoping to God that a miracle would happen, they float that basket into the water, and Pharaoh's daughter found the baby. A miracle of miracles for sure. A powerful picture of God working through and around what's going on in human affairs. Because here's the other piece that's very evident here. A mom who reflects God's heart, number three, sacrifices her own comfort for the sake of her children. What did she do? She gave up the child. She put the needs of the child before her own. Most of you recognize that a child at that age, between three and four months, is getting pretty close to the age where you can't keep it hidden anymore. I was talking to somebody yesterday who was talking about uh, having a grandchild over at the house and realizing they haven't had a little toddler at the house for a long time and the house is not childproof. Right? If you want to find out whether or not your chi- house is childproof, just bring a toddler over. Let them loose for about 15 minutes. You'll find out pretty fast. See, that's the age this child was at. 
And so recognizing everything that they were going through, they put the needs of the child first. And that's what a mom does. I want to read for you a vision that King Solomon, who would be one of the descendants of Moses, wrote in what we call Proverbs 31. It's generally entitled the wife of noble character, but I want to read it as the mother of noble character. Listen to God's word. A mother of noble character who can find. She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm. All the days of her life, she selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She's like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it's still night and she provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. She considers a field and buys it, and out of her earnings she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees her trading as profitable, and her lamp does not go go out at night. In her hand she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. And when it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed, and she is clothed in fine linen linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate, where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. This mother makes linen garments and sells them, and supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity, and this mother can laugh at the days to come. For she speaks with wisdom, and faithful instruction is always on her tongue. This mother watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. And he says, many mothers do noble things, but you surpass them all. My friends, women, charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting. But a woman, a mother who fears the Lord is to be praised. So honor the mother of the Lord for all her hands have done and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. I'm going to come back to this, but I want all of you to hear this again, and you heard it in my prayer. Regardless of your past, and in spite of potentially some very difficult current situations you might be facing right now, This is who God has called you to be, women. Mothers who reflect God's heart. And that takes faith. And that's the last thing I want to say. A woman who reflects God's heart practices her faith regardless of the circumstances. Some of you know the story and the part that I left unread, but in case there's any who don't, I want to share that the background. The starting of the book of Exodus follows 400 years after the end of Genesis. The end of Genesis has a wonderful ending. God has protected his family and sent them down to Egypt where they can be cared for during an incredibly difficult season. But 400 years later, a new king comes to power who's afraid of the Israelites. He's afraid of God's people known as the Jews. And so he commits to a course of action to enact the first genocide of the Jewish people. A systematic desire to destroy all the Hebrew children. And in spite of all that was in front of them, in spite of all that they were facing, these parents, Amram and Jochebed, still practiced their faith. And they practiced their faith in a very significant way that potentially put them and their child in harm's way. And we know this because there's a detail of that story hidden in plain sight that speaks to the power of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Ultimately, we understand faith in the Father, faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it's this simple statement. You heard it. When Pharaoh's daughter opens the basket, she looks down into that basket, and what does she say instantly? She says, look, a Hebrew child. 
And how would she have known otherwise? It wouldn't have been because of coloring or shape or any other physical characteristics, characteristics save one, circumcision, practiced on that child on the eighth day of its life. Because these parents believed in God's promises. Now, they had no way of knowing how God would fulfill, and of course, they're trusting in God's promises, not just for this day, because how many of you know we don't have very much control about what's going on? In fact, to be a parent is this. I heard someone say this, and I've been repeating it since. The older you get, the less control you have, and the more it costs. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? (laughs) They could have easily left that child uncircumcised and hoped for an Egyptian adoption. But instead, in spite of all that it was in front of their eyes, they chose to believe in the God who sees. And really, the God who sees is a perfect picture for all of you, all of you, regardless of what brought you here this morning. God sees you. He loves you. And he loves you as a mother loves an infant nursing at its breast. It's one of my powerful images that come to my mind. It's from the prophet Isaiah speaking 700 years before Jesus. He says, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. And all of us would, would go, no, there's no way a mother, even the most godless mother, could forget the child at her breast. They love that child because that is imprinted. It can't be changed. It happens because God put it there. And if the most godless of women can love their children, how much more does the God of all creation love us? You see, another piece of this story that's powerful to me is the picture of God's redemptive work. The people had been crying out for salvation. They had been crying out. Maybe some of you have felt that way yourself. You're in a situation right now even where you're crying out. Things have been hard. They've been tough. They've been difficult. Oh, God, save me. That's exactly what these people were doing. Crying out and God acted in a powerful way. One of my favorite Bible teachers, Warren Wiersbe, he actually passed away a couple weeks ago. He said, whenever God does miraculous things and has miraculous intervention on behalf of his people, it always seems to coincide with a mother and an infant son. Jochebed and Moses, Hannah and Samuel, Mary and Jesus, right here we see God's creative act showing us his purposes. Another pastor, friend of mine, always said, whenever you read God's word, pay attention to the bookends. And here's the bookend in the story of Exodus. You notice what Moses was named and who he was named by? He was named by Pharaoh's daughter. And Pharaoh's daughter named the child with a Hebrew name. Probably because, as we're implied from the story, they had talked together. And when the child was named Moses, that was, well, quite frankly, no accident. Moses means drawn out of the water. Just like God would use Moses to draw his people out of slavery through into a journey towards the promised land through the water of the Red Sea, the people would be drawn out. And this is why the New Testament writers look back at the story of Exodus and they compare baptism to that idea that we are drawn out of our slavery through the waters of baptism that point to the promises of the one who came in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the name of the one who said, I am the Father, I am the God, I am the one who is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God has promised to every single one of you 
Jesus, the Savior. And to look on him with faith and trust in the promises of the Father. I close with this. Jochebed, of course, wouldn't have been famous had we never heard about Moses. But like I said, God saw, and her name is in the Hall of Fame. No, not in Canton or Cooperstown. But in the Faith Hall of Fame. As it says in Hebrews chapter 11, by faith, Moses' parents, Amram and Jochebed, hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Brothers and sisters, I think it takes incredible faith to stand up and live for Jesus in this age. It takes incredible faith to stand up and live for his promises and to trust that his word is true, not what our eyes tell us and our ears hear from an angry and noisy culture. Instead, to trust in the God who sees us, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the one who brought forth Jesus for us. And for all of you women in the room, to hear this calling, I believe, that is on each of your lives, regardless of where you've been, regardless of what's happened to you, regardless of whether or not you are able to have children of your own, I want you to know this, that God created you to be a mother, and God created moms to reflect his heart for his children. And every woman in this room and every woman called by God has the opportunity to be a mother in God's family. God called you to be a mom, not a child. Can you imagine what this church would look like if it was filled with mothers who were after God's heart? The picture of who God said mothers would be from Proverbs 31. Regardless of your past, Regardless of your current circumstances, this is what God called you to. And I want you to hear this little piece of history that's so powerful to me. I hope it speaks to you. The early church was filled with orphans and widows and the disaffected and the disenfranchised. And it was women who stood up and said, we will follow Jesus. Women who became mothers to the family of God. Not mothers because of natural descent, but mothers because of a common faith in the one who sees and the one who saves. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord God, be at work in every heart this morning, bringing healing and bringing hope God, be at work for those who have that, that twinge that often happens when we hear your word proclaimed, that twinge of something that you want us to deal with. Give a clear picture of that next step. Maybe it's a hurt to let go of or a bitterness that we've been holding on to. Father, for those who've been through difficulty and, and tough times, whether it be someone dealing with a mother or a mother dealing with a child, we pray, Father, that you would be at work in that situation even now as we pray. And for all of us, Lord, we pray for the women in our lives. We pray for them to become all that you intended for them, to be that woman who blossoms to be a mother in the family of God. Come, Holy Spirit, and be at work in a powerful way, blessing the hearts of all the women who are here, And we pray this in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen.